sing that again. We fall down, we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. The greatness of His mercy and love at the feet of Jesus. And we King of kings, you 
As morning dawns and evening fades, you inspire songs of praise that arise from earth to touch your heart and glorify your name. Your name is a strong and mighty tower. Your name shelter like no other, your name. Let the nations sing it louder, cause nothing has the power to say but your name. Jesus in your shelter like no other, your name. Let the nations sing it louder, cause nothing has the power to say. But your name is a strong and mighty tower. Your name is a shelter like no other, your name. Let the nations sing it louder, Nothing has the power to say but your name, but your name. Amen.
I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my side. I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The God of angel armies is always by my side. You may be seated. Heavenly Father, I just, uh, just give you the honor and glory this morning. Thank you for the opportunity in this country to worship freely and to just rejoice with the words of those songs. Heavenly Father, I ask you to bless Pastor Phil this morning as he uh, exhorts to us from the word of God and just let it... Um, just be ingrained into our heart as we go forth with this year, Lord, and I pray for a, a blessing on this congregation that you will, you will have uh, big things as we reach out to people in Little Falls and in the greater world. In your name I pray, amen. Did you all decide to come to church today? That's good. That's good. I want you to take your Bibles and open them up to the book of Hebrews. We're going to look there a little bit later on, but uh, Hebrews chapter 12. And uh, by the way, we have such a good crowd this morning that when Galen uh, came up in order to seat the Myers in our row, he, he said to me, you're going to have to leave. <laughs> so I just stayed. Good to see you all this morning. I want to start out with something that's uh, pretty humorous. It's a television commercial that I think it had its origin on Saturday Night Live. A uh, couple of characters uh, played by the name Hans and Franz, one of them designed to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. And these two guys are in a fitness gym and they're trying to uh, pump up the muscles of Aaron Rodgers, who is the Green Bay quarterback. And I think you'll get a kick out of it, because today I want to talk to you about building muscle, building muscle. Let's turn the lights off and let's see the video. Hey, look, he's the same farm guy. Yeah, and he's discount double checking. Oh, Hans and Franz? Surprise. Well, here's another surprise for you. Yeah. Muscle, 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 muscle. Hear me now and believe me later. You pumped up our wallets with the discount double checking, so we want to repay the favor and pump you up. Wow. Sorry, what? Pull us, you flabby loser! You're 10 bucks later. That's right. Double check your diet. Yeah. Roll, 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 here, roll. Gently down the loser stream. That's right. what I'm talking about. Doesn't this hurt? Not with those puny arms. You don't just slip dumbbells, you drink them. Oh, come on. That's right, feel it. Hello, muscles. The whole thing? Yeah, when you're finished, you can eat this up too. Congratulations, Aaron. You earned the suit. It's a stop. Yeah, not bad. Really? Pump up your savings with a discount double check. Hi. Nice block, Adam. Get to a better state. State Farm. So the bottom line is, if we have the lights, I'm going to pump you up today with muscle. Not physical muscle, but spiritual muscle. I want to talk to you about today spiritual muscle and how we build it and what are some of the factors that are involved in developing the spiritual muscle of faith. Father, we pray that you would give to us listening ears and open hearts to understand and to apply to our own lives through the power of your spirit what we hear today, that we would grow in our walk with you, and that our spiritual muscle of faith would be built and would be strong. In Christ's name, amen. 
Now, there's a couple kinds of things in the physical world that will help you build physical muscle. One is that you can deliberately make a choice of your own to go to the gym or to just walk or to run or to do whatever you do to build muscle. But we all know that you don't lift weights just for the sake of lifting weights. You lift weights in order to build up your body so that you are able to handle the other challenges of life that require physical effort on your part, like doing home repairs or renovations or mowing the lawn or landscaping or doing garden work or just facing the multitude of challenges, trials, difficulties that you face both physically, emotionally, and spiritually throughout your life. This morning, I want to talk to you about developing the spiritual muscle of faith. And I'm going to start out with the triangle, because I think there are three basic things that are involved in building these spiritual muscles. And the first is the Holy Spirit. He's at the top of the triangle because he is the most important ingredient for you in your life to build spiritual muscle. The Holy Spirit is the generator, the administrator of the Trinity. He helps take God's desires and Jesus' intentions and work them out in your life. He is an administrator. And there's no growth in the spiritual life apart from the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He's the one who makes the first move to invite you, to call you, to bring you to Christ. You would not be a Christian. You would not come to faith if it were not the ministry of the Holy Spirit drawing you and opening up your spiritual eyes. He uses the Word of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3 says, in one of the translations, No one can find Jesus to be Lord except by the Holy Spirit. It is through his wooing and his calling that he draws you to the Lord. You and I cannot make any progress in our spiritual life, in our life of faith, without the ministry of the Holy Spirit. As I said, he's the administrator. He illumines our minds so that we can understand God's word and God's working in our life. He convicts us of sin and convinces us of righteousness and judgment. He gives us spiritual gifts in order that we can carry out the work of the ministry that he has called us to. He is our comforter. He is our strong man. He intercedes for us with the Father. He helps us in overcoming our fleshly, worldly desires. He guarantees us by his seal in our hearts the gift of eternal life. He produces spiritual fruit in us, the fruit of love and joy and patience and long-suffering and kindness and meekness. You and I cannot grow without the ministry of the Holy Spirit. God could have done all he did, the Father could have, Jesus could have died on the cross, but if it weren't for the Holy Spirit who makes those things real to us and applies them to our hearts and is the administrator I talked to a pastor one time. He said, I have, I can challenge people, but he said, I have a motor, but he said, I don't have a transmission. Well, if you don't have a transmission, you can't get the power from the engine to the wheels, and that's what an administrator does. An administrator takes the power, takes the ideas, takes us from A to Z, and designs the programs. And the Holy Spirit is the one who takes what God has done in offering his son and takes what Jesus has done in offering himself and makes that all real to us in our hearts. You could not be a Christian without the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And you couldn't grow. But you can become a Christian. And you can grow in your life through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The second and very important ingredient in, in the building of spiritual muscles is the, the circumstances of life. The circumstances of life. Rick Warren, in one of his books, says, God depends more on circumstances to make us like Jesus or to grow our faith than he does on our reading the Bible. 
Let me read that for you again. I'm not sure I agree with it, but I understand where he's coming from. God depends more on the circumstances of life to make us like Jesus or to grow our faith than he does in our reading the Bible. I wonder why that is. Maybe it's because some of us never read the Bible. Maybe it's because some of us, even as believers, don't take the time to sit down and to study and to read and to meditate upon and to get into some kind of solitude where we can allow the Bible to sink into our lives. So maybe, maybe circumstances do play a huge role in building spiritual muscle of faith. Listen to James. James, in chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith, the testing of your faith, develops perseverance, and perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete. Listen to Hebrews chapter 12. You've got it open. The text is in front of you. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. It calls Jesus the author and the perfecter or the finisher of our faith. Let me just read a couple verses to you from that passage. Therefore, since we're surrounded, verse 1, by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked before us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him... And notice, right after he talks about Jesus being the author and perfecter or finisher of our faith, notice how he goes right into talking about the sufferings of Christ. Consider him, well, I missed the last phrase in verse 2, the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you've not resisted to the point of shedding your blood, and you, and, and you have forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Notice how he, he first talks about Jesus as the author, the, the originator of our faith and the one who finishes it through the ministry of his Holy Spirit. Then he goes right into talking about Jesus and how he suffered. And then he transitions just bang like that into how the Lord brings difficult circumstances and trials in our lives to build our faith, to make us more like him. Look at the words that he uses. In fact, I want you to look through verses 5 through 11. Would you look through it closely? Verses 5 through 11. In fact, I've got to read them for you. Let me start with verse 7. I want you to pick out the most prominent word. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you're not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline... Then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. What's the prominent word? It's got to be discipline. Ten times. Ten times in verses 5 through 11. 
discipline. What are some of the words that that the author of Hebrews associates with discipline? I'll just point them out to you to save time. Look at verse 5, rebuke. Verse 6, punish. Verse 7, hardship. Verse 11, painful, coupled with not pleasant or unpleasant. Now look at the results of God's discipline in our lives. Look at verse 10, our good. Verse 10, share in his holiness. Verse 11, a harvest of righteousness and peace. Verse 11, we are trained by it. I want to talk to you about something this morning that you've, I don't think you've ever heard. Do you know what the word trained means? The word trained that the author use here, uses here come from, and I'm not trying to sound highfalutin, but it's important for you to hear this. It comes from uh, the Greek original word gum, gumnazo, which is the word from which we get our word gymnasium. And what the author is doing, and gives, given to us a very, uh, very important picture, back in the days of the Greek games, which Paul was familiar with, and the author of Hebrews, whether it was Paul or whoever it was, was also familiar with it. He, he knew that what the, what the coaches did was that in the gymnasium, they would make the athletes strip down to almost naked, if not naked. And they would examine their muscle structure. And they would design exercises to tone their muscles so that they would be ready for the competition. And that is exactly the image that the author of Hebrews uses to describe what discipline does for you and me. God's discipline, which very often he carries out through the circumstances of life. God's discipline strips us bare and demonstrates and shows up what our weaknesses are, where our weak muscles are, and trains us and works those muscles so that there is adequate muscle tone to do the job that they're supposed to do for the race that we're in. Look at how he finishes it in verse 12. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. The circumstances of life very often are, and I would say almost always, are the plan of God in our lives to bring us into discipline and to train us to be the kind of athletes, spiritual athletes with strong spiritual muscles that he wants us to be. Look at this quote from Billy Graham. I, I love this one. Within the New Testament, there is no indication that Christians should expect to be healthy, wealthy, and successful in this present age. Christ never told his disciples that they would get an Academy Award for their performances, but he did tell them to expect to have troubles. This age is interested in success, not suffering. We can identify with James and John who wanted choice seats in the kingdom. We might even ask for reclining chairs and soft music. But God's design for the development of spiritual muscle grows through you and me facing obstacles and meeting resistance and facing temptation and going through trials. Life is a series of these things. Life is a series of tasks and relationships, some that go well, some that have difficulty, challenges, trials, distractions, even tribulations and temptations. But, but you and I need to see each of these events as an occasion for the development of spiritual muscle. The problem is few of us are able to respond directly to these trials. And these trials are designed to help us face the things that will make us stronger spiritually. 
we need to adopt some practices that will prepare us to face what life throws at us. You and I need to develop what many authors have called spiritual disciplines. What do I mean by spiritual disciplines? Well, spiritual disciplines are things which you do. Let's just start with disciplines. Disciplines are things which you do, which you choose, that will help you face circumstances and difficulties and trials which other people or other situations of life choose for you. Let me put it this way. Why does a football player lift weights? Does he lift weights so that he can go out on the field and carry them around the field and show how strong he is? No, a a football player and any other athlete lifts weight not to show how much weight he can lift, but to prepare him for the obstacles and the things that he will face and the resistance that he faces when he plays the game. I watched, I watched yesterday as uh, North, North uh, Dakota State uh, gave Illinois a, a lesson in how to play football. And uh, it was a, if you didn't watch it, you missed an unbelievable game. Thanks for tipping me off, Gary, that that game was on yesterday. But I won't go all the details. But some of those guys on the line, they look like bull mooses. You know, I mean, they're just huge. They're not, they're not that way so that they can just look strong. They're that way so that they can block the other guy, so that they can keep him from doing what he wants to do. They choose, they choose to do certain disciplines so that they can face what life throws at them in the game. And these disciplines that we're talking about are are spiritual disciplines. They, They are disciplines which you and I choose so that when we face the circumstances of life, we're able to handle them. They're disciplines like solitude, Bible reading, silence, worship, prayer, sacrificial giving. Fasting. These are disciplines which you and I, as Christians, purpose to undertake so that we can take what life chooses to throw at us. And this is where this is where Rick Warren is coming from when he says, I think God does more through circumstances of life than he does through reading your Bible, because a lot of us don't read our Bible. And so God brings the disciplines of life into us so that he drives us to his word. How much better would it be if you and I would choose ourselves the disciplines of God so that when these things of life get thrown at us, we are better capable of facing them? These spiritual disciplines take time. A football player does not prepare himself for the game in two weeks of muscle building. An athlete does not get ready for whatever competition they're facing without spending a fair bit of time day after day. It takes time. You will not probably not grow spiritually by just, by just reading about one Bible verse a day. You probably will not grow spiritually like you need to to be able to face the trials of life by just, by just rushing through a prayer as you're driving down the highway. I'm not negating praying while you're driving. I'm not negating a verse for the day. I am saying that it's going to take a lot more than that to face you, to help you face the trials of life. You say, I don't have time. 
then you better make it. You better make it. It takes time. Secondly, it involves pain. Now, you can tell that I work out at the gym very lightly. I am not a fan of pain when it comes to the gym. But I watch some of these guys and gals that work out at the gym, and they are a ball of sweat by the time they're done. They're just exhausted. It involves pain. No pain, no gain. And it's the same with spiritual exercise. We have a role in this faith-building transformation. You and, I, you and I have to work at it. This action will not be done for us. It requires our involvement. You and I need, need to take the time to do it. We need to, to, to endure the pain that's involved in the discipline of doing spiritual exercise. And, and we've got to make a choice. We've just got to make a choice. Nobody else can learn Spanish for you. Nobody else can lose weight for you or me. You and I have to make the decision to, to do these things to do these spiritual exercises so that we can be strong like the Lord wants us to be. Others can help us. They can coach us. They can train us. But you and I need to put our minds to it. Look at this verse from Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Philippians 2, verses 12 and 13. Read it together with me, will you? Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not in your presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Is there, is there a two-word phrase in there that reminds you of exercise? Work out. Work out. What does work out mean? Very interesting. The New Testament word that was used for work out means this. Developing or elaborating something, bringing it to the fullness of what its nature is meant to be. Work out. Develop or elaborate something, grow it, bring it into the fullness of what its nature is meant to be. Work out. Too often we call on God to do things that the Scripture calls us to do. Too often we tell Him to make us spiritually grow. Too often we don't take the responsibility of, on our own to choose to grow spiritually. Paul writes to his followers, I think in the book of Philippians, follow me as I follow the Lord. Those things which you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. Look at that. Those things which you have learned and received. So he has imparted these to them. And heard and seen and seen in me. So he not only has taught them these things, but they've seen it in him. Those things which you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, do. Do. And the God of peace will be with you. So when it comes to developing spiritual muscle... We rely on the Holy Spirit. We exercise spiritual disciplines. 
which prepare us to face the circumstances of life. Let me put it this way, and with this I close. Be filled with the Spirit. Open your life fully to his power and his influence. Let him be the master and commander of your life. Number two, deliberately and regularly exercise your spiritual muscles. Work out. Accept the pain that accompanies self-discipline. Don't be a baby. Growing spiritual muscle will cost you something. And number three, embrace the discipline that God sends your way. He's your heavenly father, and he loves you more than you can imagine. He allows pain, suffering, and adversity into your life, just like he did his son Jesus. It's all part of the process of developing and building spiritual muscle. So accept it from your heavenly father's loving hands, because it is good. Let's grow. Let's grow. I've been excited lately to watch in the lives of just a few of you your your exercise of looking out around you for people who need to know the Lord. I had the opportunity this week of talking to a young man who you'll see in church one of these days, and I believe he'll come to know the Lord one of these days, who Mark sent my way. Now both of us, as well as another fellow in the congregation, are ministering to this guy who has great needs. Just work out your salvation. Allow God to fill you with his spirit. Work out spiritually so that you can face the circumstances of life with the strength and power and the spiritual muscle of Christ. Let's pray. Father, I've, uh, I've shared what you put on my heart. Thank you for author... Dallas Willard and others who have contributed to my understanding of these passages. Now it's it's up to you. I pray, Lord, that you would work in my heart and in the hearts of uh, this uh, group of people who I dearly love and that you would help us to um, just totally open up to the ministry of your spirit in our hearts and take on the spiritual disciplines that we need to so that we will develop the spiritual muscle of faith to be able to face what life throws at us through your sovereign hand. We love you, and we know that all you do is good, and I pray that you would help us to grow. In Jesus' name, amen. Worship team, come on up, lead us in a song, and uh, when they're done, uh, let's all stand. When they're done, I'm going to ask the McLeans if they'll come up after we've got done singing. I want to introduce them to you because they're new members of the church, so...
sir, lost sir, if this life I lose, I will follow you. I will follow you. Light into the world, light into my life. I will live for you. Kevin, where are you? There you are. Kevin and uh, Joetta and their sons. I think they've got an extra one along today. <laughs> yeah. It's great having you. They have gone through our membership class and uh, are already uh, much involved in, in ministry, and we're glad to have you on board very, very much. Let me remind you as you leave this morning, Come on up and welcome these people into membership of the church. Uh, there's coffee out in the lobby off to the side. And uh, Sunday school resumes again today right at uh, 11 o'clock. Uh, adults, those of you who have been involved in the uh, class on sharing your faith, uh, today is going to be very practical. You'll learn more about yourself and how you can share your faith. So uh, please come on back at 11. Sunday school will start then. Father, thank you for, uh, for Kevin and Joetta and their boys. Thank you for their desire to uh, continue to follow on with you and to become members of this church. Pray that you would bless our ministry to them and their ministry to us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Come and welcome them. Also, look for folks that you don't know. Quite a few folks here today. <laughs>